Good morning. Thank you. As soon as you take your seat, we are going to get started. I believe it's 830. And we are sure that we are going to stay on schedule for this seminar, which will be taking place over the next three days. We are so glad that you are here. We have just a few other people coming in at the back. Those of you at the back door, if anyone comes in, say to that person, they are expecting you on the front rows up here so we can come forward. <laughs> this is always a special occasion. We call it Happy New Year. We know it's not January 1st, but we do know that it is the first official year of the 2011-12 academic year. So if we say Happy New Year to you today, that's the context in which we are saying that. I would like to start this program by asking you to join me in a round of applause for Dr. Michael Bates for the prelude. Also, I would like to thank you for joining us for the 2011 Fall Faculty Staff Seminar. This is an important occasion on our campus. It is a time of orientation to orient you to the plans for the new academic year. It is a time of notification to notify you of new rules, policies, and regulations that guide us. It is a time of celebration, of celebration of each of you as an individual, and of celebration of a cohort of individuals who have been providing devoted service to this university for 20 years. So we're going to get started as soon as we take the seats because this is an important moment we like to take a moment of silence for all members of this university family that we have lost since we had this seminar in 2010. So let's just take a moment of memory for those persons. Thank you. To Chancellor Davis, Dr. Broom, Dr. Michael Bates, Mr. Kent Broughton, Dr. Jerry Ingram, Mr. Burst, Dean Burrow, and to this beautiful audience. You are indeed a beautiful audience. And thank you for being here. You are the realization of long-term planning by a very caring planning committee. It is listed in the back of your book. And if you see anything good about this seminar, go up to one of those persons and say, thank you, you did a good job. If there's anything you want considered for next year, do the same thing. Walk up to one of those committee members and give your recommendation. As we get started here this morning, I thought that it would be good to know who's in the audience. So the first thing that I'm going to ask for is, to ask all guests to stand. If we have any guests with us this morning, would you please stand and be acknowledged? Any guests? No guests at this point? So we're all family with the keynote speaker with us. All right? I'd like to ask all new faculty, staff, and administrators to stand. All new faculty, staff, and administrators to stand. And let's give them a resounding yay. Thank you so much. And now, I know that any person in this audience makes a decision whether or not he or she will be a part of our team. So when you return to us, it makes us feel very special. So I would like to ask all returning faculty, staff, and administrators to stand. All returning faculty, staff, and administrators to stand. Great, great.
great, great, great audience. The fact that you stood up, we took that as your pledge to continue support for this great university. And now, you know what? We are all about students. At the end of the day, that's why we are here. So I would like to ask all students in the audience and on the stage to please stand, all students that are with us. We are so glad you're here. One of the things on the evaluation form is, did you know the purpose? Did we clearly tell you the purpose of this workshop? Let me give you that quickly, and then we'll go with the program as printed. The purpose of this workshop is, first of all, to hear Chancellor Davis's call for action for 2011-12. The whole theme is around stakeholders. And each person in this audience is a stakeholder. So we need to hear the chancellor's call for action on the campus at the university. Then we are going to hear from a regional perspective where higher education should be headed. We will also hear from a state perspective with the legislative panel on what the state is expecting of the various universities that receive public funding. We will also get information on how to serve the underserved student. We will hear about new approaches to, to excellence, the essentials of excellence here at this university. Each one of you is, at the end of the day, a person. So we need to know what our fringe benefits are here at the university, what our wellness program is here at the university, and we are going to take time to share that with you. For the new faculty and staff, we always have a workshop to give you close-up information about this academic environment and to answer any questions that you might have. Also, at the end of the day, at the end of the seminar for Wednesday, and then we go into the specialized groups, the Chancellor and Mrs. Davis always give a reception in honor of UAPB employees. You have a full agenda. I wish that you would look it over we have a benefits fair. We have a new faculty staff and adjunct orientation. We have the reception. All of those have been planned sequentially to give you, first of all, a good feeling about being back here or joining us. But secondly, to give you a body of knowledge that you will take from today and use in your school meetings, in your divisional meetings, in your departmental meetings, and finally, in your own role here at the university. That is the purpose of this seminar. And now, whenever we have an official program at this university, we always start with greetings by the leader, Chancellor Davis. He will give greetings. After him, we will have greetings from Dr. Bates, who is the president of the Faculty Staff Senate, and by Mr. Kent Broughton, who is the president of the Student Government Association. The program will proceed in that order, and thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I always get excited this time of year. How many of you all grew up on the college campus? <laughs> See? I did. And so each time we get to this point, it's just like a rebirth for me. So I'm happy to see all of you back. We are us at a great time in history. And I say that because opportunity is what allows you to become great. If you look back in history and think about the generals of the army who were great, Patton, MacArthur, Eisenhower, you look at the great presidents, Lincoln, Washington, Roosevelt, Truman, why were they great? 
they became great because they faced great challenges at the time. So we are facing, if you look across the nation, and you look at what is happening in the state of Arkansas, you understand that we have a challenge. But it's also a time in which we can become great. I welcome you to the break. Good morning. Chancellor Davis, and Dr. Benjamin, Vice Chancellors, student leaders, platform dignitaries, faculty, staff, students, guests, good morning. good morning. I think that covers about everybody. Uh, I'm asking, again, even though Dr. Benjamin had you stand already, I'm asking all new faculty and staff, and those who have joined us since this time last year, would you please stand? You don't have to stay standing long, but I would like you to stand. Let's give them a hand, please. Okay, it's my pleasure to extend a hearty welcome to each one of you on behalf of the University Assembly, the Senate, and the UAPB family. Among the many overriding positives we have at UAPB, I want to highlight three of those. One, we have a distinguished history. Two, we have contemporary relevance. And three, we have a bright and productive future. I attended the annual summer U m and UAPB alumni conference in Little Rock, and I sensed a new and re-energized spirit led by the president, Mr. Calvin Booker, who is a distinguished corporation executive with waste management. I received a telephone call from Mr. Booker yesterday regarding fall homecoming activities, and that excitement just came through the telephone as he was trying to nail some things down. At our chairs meeting yesterday, I listened as Dr. Colin gave exciting news about corporations that want to partner with UAPB and are anxious to hire our students. I listened to uh, uh, Professor Daniels with, as he spoke with excitement about those things that were happening in the nursing department. I listened to Mr. Linton talk about those things that were happening in the art department. As I was leaving yesterday, I saw Professor Collins and her staff uh, with, from drama rehearsing with those persons who are going to be in this interesting play. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so lots of interesting things are happening. And of course, I couldn't miss talking about <clears throat> the Vesper Choir and its students who were going to be on the national stage at the Kennedy Art Center, the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and in Atlanta also, in a mega event that's partially sponsored by PBS. So we have de developments in the PhD program in aquaculture and fisheries. We have the new STEM building and program. We have initiatives in computer education and other initiatives all across campus that have national significance. As the chancellor said, this is an exciting time. This, UAPB, is an exciting place. We want our new members of the UAPB family to become engaged in the academic and intellectual pursuits and social activities of our students and members of our faculty and staff, your colleagues. Get to know the historical context within which AM and UAPB has existed and continues to prosper. UAPB has an, important, has an important role in the state, in the nation, and the world. I encourage you who are coming on board to make a difference in the lives of our students, make a difference in the, lives of, in the life of our campus. My challenge to you is to engage yourself intellectually, socially, and in other positive ways. We want you to mentor. We want you to, to advise. We want you to counsel. We want you to model the attributes of a scholar and an accomplished professional. Roll up your sleeves and get to work. To returning faculty and staff, I say welcome back. We are all in the same boat. And that which I have said to the new faculty also applies to you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. It's truly um, a blessing to be here today to welcome you to the fall um, and staff seminar. It's truly the individuals that sit before this room and behind me that is truly the life support of this institution. The student body has gave me the honor to represent them as a student voice, and we are truly excited, as Dr. Bates has just said, about the different components that I know this faculty and staff will put forth in the future for the growth of this institution. When he talks about mentoring, talks about inspiring individuals, because these are the individuals that are going to transpire this world. One thing I want to say is, I'll give you a little story about a man who once attended a college. 
and he didn't have that much enthusiasm from his family back home. But it was because of that professor who took the time to mentor him, to figure out the trade, and to be that inspiration and that support that he became a world leader. And that is the reason and the story that I want to hear over and over again from the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, that we're trying leaders and that we are being a true inspiration to the students here at the university. So once again, I want to say welcome, and I'm looking forward to an exciting year, and the student body is looking forward for an exciting year, and we are going to continue to grow this university onward and upward. Thank you. Thank you so much for those greetings. We are so proud of our student leaders, and, and I'll just stand here and pledge on behalf of all of us that we will continue to help grow this university and help it to reflect the vision that you laid out at the alumni conference in, in Little Rock. I hope by now you feel welcome, not only welcome, but appreciated. You know, I want you to know that we appreciate the fact that you are here with us. Our program continues with a reflective moment. Dr. Laura Fester is not able to be with us this morning, but we have a lot of depth in the School of Arts and Sciences. So the dean reached into the Social and Behavioral Sciences Department and invited Dr. Jerry Ingram to do the reflective moment. After Dr. Ingram finishes, Dean Dovey Burrell will introduce the chancellor. When she finishes the introduction, Mr. Stephen Burst will do a solo. After that, the chancellor will speak. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. The theme the chancellor and others have chosen for this year is stakeholders sustaining our mission and maintaining accountability. I'd like to dissect our theme just a bit this morning. I'll begin with the mission of our No Excuse University, and that is to provide a, a quality, affordable education with a personal touch. Now, I think we're doing an excellent job in fulfilling our mission, but our mission can only be accomplished with the assistance of stakeholders. Now, a stakeholder is simply a person uh, or a group with a direct interest, involvement, or investment in something. Now, UAPB has many stakeholders, as we all know, and some are external and some are internal. Our external stakeholders are those we normally think of, governmental bodies, but they also include other educational institutions we may partner with, and also the community at large. Obviously, many of our external stakeholders support our mission through their funding. And understandably, they expect us to be good stewards of their money. That is, we must be held accountable. Our internal stakeholders, as Dr. Benjamin mentioned uh, briefly, include us, the staff, the faculty, the administrators, and importantly, the students. Clearly, each of these groups has a direct interest, involvement, and investment in UAPB. Thus, by definition, they are all stakeholders. And each ought to be held accountable to one another, especially when it comes to fulfilling our mission. So as we begin our journey through this academic year, let us reflect on our personal interest, involvement, and investment in UAPB, and the ways in which we can be held accountable to one another. Doing so will result in a better you, a better me, and a better UAPB. Thank you. Good morning, family. Katherine Stocker is the author of the book entitled The Help. Did, by any chance, any of you see the movie this past weekend, or have you read the novel? Can I see a show of hands, please? OK, a few of you. Highly recommended. Without giving away all of the details, I just want to use one excerpt of the movie. Miss Abilene, who was a main character in the, the movie, as she was departing her duties, 
she wanted to say her goodbyes to the little girl that she was caring for, whose name was Mae Mobley. Mae Mobley was only two. So Abilene said to Mae Mobley, I want you to always remember what I said to you. Don't you ever forget it. Now tell me what I taught you. And May Mobley said, I is kind, I is smart, and I is important. <laughs> so if I could use those character references to introduce our presenter this morning, I want to tell you something and I don't want you to forget it. He is kind, he is smart, and he is important. Now tell me what I said. <laughs> and here he is. After the soloist, I ask that you would join me in welcoming our family head, Chancellor Lawrence A. Davis, Jr. Thank you. And Ms. Barrow, thank you. You know how to follow instructions. <laughs> I told her to just say, there he is. <laughs> but it's wonderfully and beautifully done. Uh, with recognitions to the appropriate individual platform, our speaker, to all of you. It's hard for me to convey to you the passion with which I approach what I have to do. A lot of decisions have to be made. And I told my staff, I was gonna say this, Dr. Benjamin, they told me not to bone, you know, I'm hard-headed. And so Dr. Broom, I said, you know, I have to make a lot of decisions. I don't know, whenever you make a decision, you always have people that don't agree. But one of the things that occurred to me, Dr. Jones, I said, I said, I wonder, when my decision-making ability became bad, before I appointed you or after? <laughs> but we have a very exciting topic. Stakeholders' mission and accountability. First of all, we need to understand what our mission is. Branch Normal didn't just happen. It was planned. It was planned because of a need. And if you look at the history, the need has not vanished. We aren't a lot better off than we were when it was created, when Branch Normal was created. Ab and N had to carry on that mission of Branch Normal because of the segregation laws that were created. Later on, we became UAPB. But under the name, the mission is the same. Provide opportunities for the underserved. Now, you know, I have attended a lot of schools. AM and N, University of Arkansas Fayetteville, University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, University of Georgia, 
Brown University, Iowa State, University of Oklahoma. As student, I know what each of these institutions do. I know what their mission is. And when I was at Brown in the Ivy League, I wrote my dad and said, Dad, these people are not even in the same universe with us. Because the students there didn't even need Brown University, if you understand what I'm saying. The students that we have at this institution need us. And they need us in the worst kind of way, in the best kind of way. Now, as I just said in my introduction, we're on the threshold of greatness. Because every time you have a challenge, it's an opportunity. Now, you can run and hide and lament, but it's a great opportunity to demonstrate what you really are and a chance to become great. Now, over the years, we have achieved a lot. But as my dad said years ago, Dr. Brown, Nothing you have ever done would be good enough again. We brought Miss Obama here uh, for our commencement. I was in the grocery store. What you gonna do this year? <laughs> <laughs> Packley said, who was a former chancellor, he said, the challenge of success is you have to repeat it. So you can't live on one championship. The people want to know what you're going to do this year. Those championships are soon forgotten. But one of the, some of the things that we have been able to do, and I'm not only going to talk about what we think we have accomplished, but also what we have yet to accomplish. And I'm doing this, see, because a lot of people watch our television. They don't want you to know it, but they do. And that is one way for us to help them understand what we are about. Now, first of all, our physical plan. Now, we have challenges, as you might know, air conditioning and so forth. But anyone that has been here knows that we are transitioning this campus. We have a beautiful campus. We have all our academic programs in decent facilities. And when I started out a few years ago, we were parking in the quadrant. And I looked out there one day, I said, we're going to make this a pedestrian campus. We're not going to have that. Because with that, you couldn't have a beautiful campus. And why are you interested in a beautiful campus? Because the environment is critical to the educational process. No one that smokes a cigarette that's intelligent would put it on the floor in here and put it out. But outside, you would. So the environment makes a difference. So all of our facilities are almost there. As I speak, they're trying to complete Rust Tech and Corbin Hall. And we're able to do this, you see, because we are a Title University, Title III, which they cut $400,000 this year. Land Grant, which helped us support agriculture and aquaculture. Entitlement. So we've used our entitlement money, Dr. Gordon. That's the reason this auditorium looks like this. That's the reason the music wing looks like it looks. That's the reason the student union looks like it looks, and so on. Because we have taken those funds and invested them in our facilities. We also invest some money in faculty. Dr. Bates, I forced him to go to school three times. <laughs> Didn't Dr. Bates? So he got a degree so he could come back and help us. We have invested. Now, looking to the future, thanks to Dr. Benjamin Huffo, we have recruited some excellent young people. Dr. Rice, Dr. Rice, Dr. Page, Dr. Butler, Dr. Butler, Dr. Coburn, because we have to have fresh young talent with our people. Now, we have maintained our accreditations. When I was a dean, we didn't have them all, Dr. Payne. But I said then, when I was a dean, I was a dean 15 years, 
I said all of our programs that be, can be accredited need to be accredited because I knew there would come a day when there would be questions about the proliferation. Accreditation is one vote in your favor. So art, music, education, industrial technology, social work are all maintaining their accreditations. We have two challenges though, didn't we? Nursing and dietetics, but it wasn't because of lack of resources. It was a lack of people doing what it was that they were supposed to be doing. Now, technology. Many institutions under the rubric of HBCU, Reverend, are talking about technology black. We are on the cutting edge. We have IP technology. Do you understand what that means? We have fiber optics communication of all of our technology. Radio, television, internet. And we were able to do it in part because of Title III and the thing that Congress is now talking about getting rid of, which is Port Barrel money. <laughs> money directed, and we put it into our system, IP technology. And not only that, we are connected to our own Arkansas Research Education Optic Network, which gives us broadband access. That's the best you can get. And a group of us are going to be going to Southern next month, Southern University, to see how they have been able to make use of that and see if we can improve our use of that here at UAPB. We have a television and radio station. Why do we want that? Well, first of all, it's so the students can be trained. And our equipment in many cases is better than some of that that they have in the commercial stations. But our television broadcasts 24-7. Our radio station broadcasts 24-7, 50,000 watts. We hit all the way to Little Rock. Why? Because you need to be able to show people who you are. And this program right now, it will be on television at a time. We have it looked at our security situation. You may not know it, but if we have an emergency, we can gate this campus off. Took some doing to do that. We have blue lights. The blue lights are there, so if you have an emergency every now and then, I'll punch you one to see if our people are really on it. <laughs> they're saying they're answering the phone. I say, I'm just checking to see if it's working. Because <laughs> just because you have it doesn't mean it's working. And then we have cameras. Right now in my office, they can be watching me. We're going to have to have more cameras, though, because you can't watch a campus this large <laughs> with the uh, force that we have, but it's for your protection. We have a print shop. <laughs> now, it took some doing, because people didn't want to use it, but if you look at the program that you have, look on the back, UAPB printing service. You need to be able to print your own materials. We have a print shop that can print practically anything you need printed. Now, we could have even more, Dr. Williams, but I gave people a blank check. I said, buy everything you need to print, everything you need, and they didn't know. And then I looked up one day and found out that we had equipment that was not compatible, so we had to get new people. <laughs> <laughs> See, a lot of people don't understand what no excuse means, Dr. Bay. No excuse means that when you ask, we give you everything you ask for, and you're not successful, then you have to be the problem. It's simple deductive reasoning, isn't it, Doctor? Okay. Now, we have given a we are one of five research universities in the state. Now, what does that mean? That in terms of research dollars, that we're one of the top five, primarily because of our land grant mission. 
But the other institutes, the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences, Arkansas State University, University of Arkansas Fayetteville, University of Arkansas Little Rock, University of Arkansas Pamela. We are the research alliance in Arkansas. Under the leadership of Dr. Benjamin, we have acquired over $12 million to invest in our STEM programs. And just yesterday, Dr. Benjamin, Ms. Thomas was successful in getting our MOF approved so that we can move forward in the STEM village. We have enhanced our tutorial programs to enhance the success rate of our students. You heard Dr. Bates say that we're going to have to really do it because you see the mandates, the accountability that the legislature is demanding of us, and rightfully so, requires that we're going to have to do a better job with the students that we have. And I tell the fact all the time, you have to teach the students you have, not the ones you wish you had, because you don't have them. <laughs> Now, some of you may not know it, but we have a campus in North Little Rock, which is an entry for students who are interested in certain specific programs that we have, like regulatory science. We have the only program in the world. And when I sat last week with the governor and the uh, head of NCTR, and he mentioned the fact that we had that only, that singularity. But they helped us develop it. NCTR, years ago, they said, we need to develop a program that is unique. And so we work with the scientists at that institution to develop regulatory science. And he said to me, we need those programs now more than ever before. We tried to improve the, the environment of our campus. Now, Mrs. Burr, I sent to the union, I said, fix it. If you go in there now, it's fixed. We worked on our residence hall. I sent some people, I said, fix it. Now, we haven't got where we need to be, but if you had known how your students were living, you would have hung your head in shame, but we have addressed it. We have something yet to do. We have an incubator on Main Street. I said years ago, we want a downtown presence. I was thinking about office. But because of Mr. Golette, who doesn't get any money from us directly, I think we pay for utilities, we have an incubator downtown. That incubator is designed to help entrepreneurs be successful. We worked on it in connection with the local lending institutions. And in that facilities, we have taste setters a restaurant that wouldn't be there if it wasn't for UAPB. Down the road here, we have our uh, UAPB Plaza. For the first time, Dr. Broom, in 20 years, have a grocery store on this side of Martha Mitchell is because of us. <laughs> Just recently, we had some good news. Working with the city, we convinced the powers of be to give us some money so that we can make University Drive look the way it's supposed to look. You see, one of the things I don't like, I don't like all these wood posts standing around on the campus up and down our streets. <laughs> so we have a grant so that we can bury the wiring so that the only thing we're going to have along University when it's completed, a light pole, steel light pole, that make it look like you're going to a university. They didn't get to see all the campus. We have a huge campus right here. The farm alone is over 300 acres. And then, you know, we have extended down the highway our baseball complex, our softball complex. Then we have an 871 acre research facility at Lone Oak, that's the National Center for Water Research Management. We have sites at Lone Oak, Disease Diagnostic Center to Lone Oak, Lake Village, Newport. We're way, we're spread out. Now, 
You know, years ago, when I was looking at what our objectives were, I said, now, I want to have a defensible athletic program. And we were playing in Pumphrey Stadium then. And now we have a new stadium, the baseball complex, softball complex. We've added the sports, soccer, baseball, softball, golf, tennis. And people say, oh, how that athlete? Do you realize that each athlete Athlete is a student, a student who wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the team. Athletics makes it necessary to have a band. If we didn't have a football team, we could have a band. We wouldn't need about 25, 30 people, Dr. Bay. <laughs> and every student, every person in the band is also what? A student. This provides an opportunity for that education to be paid for. Now that's another debate, and I'm not going to go into all that. I'm getting it in. Now, you know, my attitude is, if you challenge me, you just got ready for a fight, right? Anybody really know me? I'm kind, but I'm also, well, I have another side. <laughs> but, Anyone that is looking at what is going on in our society has to be concerned. How can we accept and look the other way a system that's failing most of the people? Now, we have access that's supposed to be the gateway for college. The last time around, 77% roughly of all the students that took it needed at least one course of remediation. But 96% of the African Americans, the average act score for African Americans in Arkansas is about 16.7. So if you have a campus full of those African Americans, guess what? Your act score is going to be very close to that. But it doesn't mean that they don't have ability. It doesn't mean that they can't learn. It means that they have not been taught. And why do we put up with a system that's not working for our students? It's criminal. It's criminal. But you don't curse the darkness, you light a candle. So we pull together all of the superintendents of the local areas and our deans and the vice chancellor, and we're going to do something about it. And you see, I'm not talking about what I think. I'm not talking about theory. Do you understand? I had 33 years in the classroom. I taught the most difficult subject you can teach, mathematics and physics. Students can learn. But one thing about it, you have to know who you're teaching, and you have to know what they already know. You can't teach a kid from Chicago. How, by, how fast the height of water in the trough is uh, uh, rising uh, when it's flowing in at 50 gallons per minute, and then we know what a trough is. <laughs> you can't teach a kid that whose only book in the house is the Bible and say, what's the probability of pulling the ace out of a deck when they don't even know that there are 52 cards and four aces? Right. <laughs> That's where you have to start. You have to have a, a passion about it. We have to do something for our kids. Now, you see, the United States is in big trouble. Because anytime you have to import all of your expertise from outside of the country, you're in trouble. And then I ask them, what are you going to do with these kids that are roaming around here with nothing to do? When I was a little boy, we had full employment. All I had to do was get in front of the camp and catch the truck. Trucks don't run anymore. We have to do something. Now, having said that, we've been eating an elephant one bite at a time. But you know that elephant is, is a dollar elephant left. And here's some things that we've got to do. We've extended our academic menu. In fact, 
Uh, we just offered our first master's degrees during the time that Dr. Benjamin joined us. We have to do something about expanding and making it more relevant. We're still working on accreditation for business, Dean Martin. We still have to take care of the challenges we have in nursing and dietetics. We still need to do better for our residence halls. We've not constructed a track for our team. We were using the Pine Bluff High, but one of our coaches insulted the people and they wouldn't let us use it anymore. <laughs> we have not obtained our enrollment goals. Our people in maintenance, they work very, very hard, but they're working against a big tide. We need a maintenance program. What that means to me, I saw one at our state. And the way it works, President, every year they came around and polished the donut. Every year they painted the room. Every year they did a lot of things just routinely. We haven't been able to get there yet because we started so far down in the hole. We are still working on the alumni support that we need, and we have a president now that's fired up, so I see it coming. We don't have sufficient support for the athletic program. We're working to get it out of our pockets, but it takes a little bit more. You see, at some institutions, if you're on the faculty, you will have a season ticket. And we don't do that. We hope that you would be benevolent. <laughs> <laughs> and help us out. <laughs> we yet have to meet these productivity standards. Now, when Dr. Benjamin came, we had 14 standards. And we were doing pretty well, and then they said, well, the money ain't going right. Let's get rid of that. But we're back to standards again. I have no problem with that. We have three mandatories, and we have seven that we're going to have to choose, and then we will be graded by that, but we think the downside of it is they're going to take money from all of the higher education institutions, put it in a pot, and you have to try to earn it back. That's a real challenge. But guess what? No man is out. We don't stand alone. The other institutions are the same boat that we are. Then the last thing is, uh, we know that it's long because we're going to have big changes in leadership at this university. We're not ready, but we've got to get ready for that. If UAPB is to continue and become greater, all of us, alumni, faculty, students, staff, we have to be the ones to make the difference. They talk about how great Harvard is. Why is Harvard great? Harvard is great because generations of families have continued there, graduated there, become successful, and then sent support back to Harvard. Not only financial, but vocal. We have great people serving all over the United States in Little Rock. One of my students said, most of my teachers were from you, Amy, and they wouldn't even tell me. So finally, there's a time, you've heard this before, in the affairs of men, when the tide is at the flood. If not taken, we are doomed. For UAPB, the tide is at the flood. Great opportunity. Thank you, Chancellor Davis, for your broad-based presentation. And for ending with, I wrote down 10 action plans, 10 areas. Remember we said this is for orientation, it's for celebration, it's for notification. And what you are hearing here today, we are asking you to take it tomorrow in your divisional, school, and departmental meeting. So it's not the kind of thing where we just want to come and listen, and then three days later, what, what do they talk about? No, 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 no. It is hear it, take it, and do something about it. I like the way the Chancellor started by talking about the resources that we have, which are a lot. And let me just pause and ask those people that are standing, come on down. We reserve some seats for you right here. <laughs> right here. Come on. Come on. You know, like they do on TV, come on down. Right over here. <laughs> no, seriously, we want you to be comfortable. We want you to, to hear, 
what is being said and assume you're right in here. I feel so, so, so pleased to have these roles right here filled. Yes, yes. That, thank you so much for cooperating with us. Each person in a seat right now and those five or six that are standing, each person is a stakeholder. And what we are doing, we are painting the picture for you of where we are, how we want to grow this institution, and what are some of the areas that we should focus on to be able to grow this institution. So by now, at the back of your book, you have a section that's set aside for notes. You should have at least 10 areas that Dr. Davis presented. Now, Ms. Burrell used three to present the chancellor, and we all are gonna remember those. So there are 13 things that you should be remembering right about now. And if you, have, if you don't remember them, we do have questions and answers on the end. We'll come back and repeat it. You know how sometimes your students say, would you repeat the question? Uh, would you say that again? So we have to say it again. We're happy to. But I also wanted to thank Ms. Burrell for a delightful introduction and Mr. Burris for a wonderful solo, Dr. Bates for accompanying him. Let's give them all another resounding round of applause. Mr. Burris is so talented that I asked him while we were in the green room, what language are you saying in today? Will it be German? Will it be French? Uh, he said, I'm saying English today. So, <laughs> we appreciate you so much. Now, Dr. Davis, has given you the call for action from the university perspective. We are going to broaden the horizon just a bit and now take a look at the regional perspective. And then right after we get a, a, a break, we're going to look at the state perspective. So we want you to have close up knowledge because we believe that the more you are informed as a stakeholder, the better able you are to help us move this university to the point where it should be. We're going to ask Dr. Freda Carroll, who is interim dean for the School of Education, to come and introduce our regional presenter, Dr. Carroll. Good morning. Good morning. I have the wonderful opportunity of introducing our speaker, Dr. Stephen K. Broom. Dr. Broom is the Director of State Development for High Schools and Middle Grades with the Southern Regional Education Board, where he leads the work in effective implementation of the high schools at work and making middle grades work initiatives in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, New Mexico, Ohio, and Washington, D.C currently serving more than 1,700 sites in 32 states, the two initiatives frameworks are joined in their goal to prepare students for educational and workforce readiness by not only improving curriculum and instruction in high schools and middle grades, but by instituting school and classroom structures that promote student engagement, supporting effective middle and high school transitions, raising performance in low-performing and urban high schools, and increasing standards in career and technical uh, education. Prior to his work with the Southern Region Education Board, Dr. Broom served as Assistant Superintendent for High Schools for Jackson Public Schools, the largest school district in the state of Mississippi. The Jackson Public Schools High School Division demonstrated remarkable progress during this time, including increased graduation rate, decreased dropout rate, over a 400% increase in AP enrollment, and achieved the highest ACT scores in the district's recent history. Dr. Broom has served as a high school principal, an assistant principal, and a chemistry and physics teacher. A graduate of Millsaps College, where he was a two-year recipient of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Research Grant, Dr. Broom received a Master of Education degree in School Administration and Supervision from Mississippi College. 
and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Educational Leadership from the University of Mississippi. Please join me in giving a warm UAPD welcome to Dr. Stephen K. Broom. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Dr. Davis, the last time I was uh, here, there was two speakers that followed me that said they may not want to have followed me. <laughs> now I'm here following you, and I want to tell you what, you're quite a speaker. <laughs> You are kind. I tell you, you can hear the care in his voice that he has for this campus, for you, and for the kids here, most importantly. And you are smart. You make a coherent speech. There's a lot of speeches. I go all around this country. I lead our teams that go in and out of, oh, almost 2,000 schools now all over this country. And I've got 150 full-time employees. And I want to tell you what, we spend a lot of time hearing people talk and give messages. And the, Lack of coherence is amazing. You can give a coherent speech. <laughs> you are definitely important, and so is your university, and so are you in this audience. That what you have to do for this community, in your state, in this nation, is the most important work that we can do, because there is, right now, a tipping point that America is in right now. So, I've been asked back today, I came to your Educational Access Conference, and the message is somewhat the same, but I also focused a whole lot on mission and accountability for that mission uh, to match what it is that, that, that you're about in this convocation exercise. Um, first, I'm going to start with why can't we do what we've always done? Why isn't it good enough? Why do we have to change? Then what must we do? What should states do? What should school districts do that serve students? What should our universities and schools do? And what should you do? the ones that have the most impact on students everywhere, teachers and professors. Why can't we do what we've always done? There's a, if you like any of the comments I say, our website is full of free material. It's www.sreb.org. And you can see a blueprint in there for the next generation of school accountability and what it's going to take and what we think it's going to take to get us to that next level because we've spent a lot of time with standards-based reform and it has gotten us some progress in some areas but it has not gotten us all to where we want to be part of the problem is is this graph right up here I took the date off of it recently because I wanted to leave you guessing as the date on it but this graph up here shows a depiction of the educational pipeline and you can see that if you start with a hundred percent of ninth graders why do you suppose I started the graph with ninth graders? Because basically, we get everybody to the ninth grade. That's where the challenge begins. There may be some roots of the challenge and preparedness underneath there, but we basically take all the kids to the ninth grade. In ninth grade, there's something that begins. It's a Carnegie unit chase. It is about Carnegie units when you get to the ninth grade. If you look at the ninth grade and you look at what happens to those 100% of ninth graders, every 100 ninth graders that are there, and four years later, about 63 out of every 100 graduate. Now, there's about 13 different methodologies of calculating graduation rate, and there's at least 10 different organizations monitoring graduation rate, and you'll get numbers that range all the way from 50 to the most rose glasses views that you're going to see is 80%. But it depends on what students you're looking at, and it depends on where they are. If you were to look at inner city, urban, large cities, the graduation rate is arguably below 50% in many large urban areas. 63%, um, according to the Stanford Bridge Project, is pretty much on target with what we see. Um, the, if you look at the number of those 100 ninth graders that enter college, of those 100 ninth graders that enter our college, only about 38 of those 100 actually enter college five years after being a ninth grade. And that's any kind of college, second year or four, two year or four year colleges. If you look at that rate of those original 38 freshmen that entered into college, only about 22 of them returned for their sophomore year. Now, wait a minute. We've got a challenge when we talk about high school dropouts. They drop out on us, we call them freshmores. <laughs> they return their sophomore year and they basically have accumulated one or two Carnegie units, usually it's PE or health. 
and then they come back and they, they drop out as a sophomore, but they're really their freshman years. Colleges have the same challenge. It's a freshman issue. You lose, not you in particular, we in America, lose half our freshmen every year. We lose basically half our freshmen every year. If they return for their sophomore year, about 18 of those 22 earn a four-year degree within three to six years if they return for their sophomore year. The date on this data that I'm showing you right here is from the mid-2000s. It's about 2006, 2007. But it would not matter what date I put on here as long as I was about 1960 and up. For four to five decades, this data has not changed. This pipeline has been exactly like it is for four to five decades ago. Do you remember your high school English teacher, your senior year English teacher? I want you to remember her for just a second. You got her? You laughed. She's like this, wasn't she? She was tough. If it wasn't your English teacher, it was somebody else. There was somebody there that was tough. That's because the mission of the 1960s and 70s, middle school, high school, and college for that matter, was to find out who had the right stuff and determine it and be a gatekeeper and decide and sort out and decide who had the right stuff and who did not have the right stuff. Even when I got to college, it was in college, it was my organic chemistry teacher. He took great pride in being the sorter of pre-med students. <laughs> he decided who had the right stuff and who did not have the right stuff. It was a sophomore year of college that was there. I want to tell you what, increasingly that's not what America needs for us. I'm not saying that we need lower expectations. What I'm saying is, is that we have to increase this pipeline issue problem. There's a recent kid that's very close to me, grew up very close to me, that wanted to be an engineer all his life, took everything that he could take in engineering, entered college as a freshman in Texas, and within about October came home and said, I no longer want to be an engineer. Majored in biology, got a four-year degree in biology, finished biology with an A-B average. You know what he's going back to now? master's degree program in engineering because he didn't really want to be a biologist. The jobs that are there for him are not there for him. You know the reason why he came home in October and said he didn't want to be an engineer? That's exactly right. It's a teacher. A teacher makes a huge difference. A teacher makes a huge difference. And it hasn't got anything to do with the kid's ability. It's got to do exactly what Dr. Davis was about. Caring enough to get the needs, the social, I love what uh, Dr. Was it Dr. Um, um, Bates said earlier about engaging kids socially. We're going to talk about four, or engaging faculty socially. We're going to talk about that in a, in a few minutes about the four areas of engagement for kids. For the kids that take remedial studies nationwide, you should not feel alone. 63% of kids at all two-year institutions, this is nationwide day, um, take remedial courses. 40% of kids at four-year institutions take remedial courses. The challenge is, is we're not very successful with those remedial courses. The other challenge for us is, is that this country doesn't need for us any longer to determine who has the right stuff. This country needs us to give almost all kids the right stuff. There is simply not a place for the dropout to drop into anymore. Whether it's a high school dropout, you know, only about 8% of the jobs in America are for the high school dropout. Whatever you think the high school completion rate is, I don't think it's any higher than 65%. When you take 35% of kids dropping out, and you take only 8% of jobs in America for the high school dropout, we have a national crisis. We've got a problem. Increasingly, that 32% of job growth right there and above, that's at the associate's degree. That 23% is at the bachelor's degree. The 19% is bachelor's plus. There's 24% job growth in areas that have doctoral degrees. Look at those low numbers down there. We have a population explosion going on in this country, but yet the numbers of jobs, the percent growth in jobs for everybody that has a high school degree or below are not there to support our population growth. We simply have to increase the pipeline going through two-year colleges and four-year colleges if our country is to survive. It has to be done. 
some appalling graduation statistics. And I graduated when I started teaching. I taught at inner city urban high schools. And that's all I've ever taught in inner city urban high schools. I've been an administrator of a rural school once or twice. But I taught 98% African American students. That's, at least that's what the school said. 98% African American students. I think all I ever taught was African American students in my classroom. And 93% free and reduced lunch in the middle of, the middle of Jackson, Mississippi, okay? And in, in the world, you know this because you're from Arkansas, in the world, there's poor places, and then there's poor places. <laughs> this is the other side of here. It's poor. And Dr. Davis is just right. Those kids can learn. Those kids get, our kids was as, as great as they want to be, but you got to engage them. you got to care about them. you got to challenge them, and you've got to put it out there, and you can't be a gatekeeper for them. We simply can't go on like we're going on before. It is a perfect storm. You are a cog in this wheel. Our K-12 institutions are a cog in this wheel. The state is a cog in this wheel. We all have to work together to increase this educational pipeline. We simply can't live with a sort of model that has carried us through the last four decades. We simply have to reach kids that we've never reached before. To reach kids that we've never reached before, we've got to do things that we've never done before. And that we is all of us. So what do we need to do? States, districts, universities, schools, and teachers and professors just like us. What should states do? States got to move beyond just setting goals and assessing and reporting results. The standards-based reform era took us a long way. They do need to continue to implement state and local accountability initiatives, set those accountability goals, and report results and give sanctions. But that is simply not enough. States have to have a focused set of strategic actions that they ask school districts and schools to take to build the confidence that improved results can be achieved. You know, adults act on basis of belief. And adult actions, a lot of times, are through years and years of beliefs about what some kids can do and what some kids can't do. And only by getting the adult themselves to behave differently will you change their belief. You can't wait to change everybody's belief before your ship sets stale. Sometimes it won't leave the harbor. Sometimes we have to, we know enough, I was thinking about this when you were speaking, we know enough to educate every child that is of interest to us to educate. I'm telling you, we do. We know enough to educate every child that's of interest to us to educate. And you're right, it is a, it, it is a, it's like breaking the law. It's more than like breaking the law. It's more than criminal. It's a sin for us not to reach out to those kids that we, that are the most need of us, that are in the most need of the help that we can give them with proven actions that we know can work. But what happens with adults, and we're all adults, you have to show me something different which means sometimes you have to get me to behave something different so I can get some different results. And when I get those different results than I've ever had before, then I'll take that action on my own. But a lot of times, a course of action has to be laid out clearly before folks. And that's why you need strong leaders. That's why you need strong leadership. State action. State actions, including include percentages of high school students in your state accountability model. Get beyond just a testing accountability model for high schools. Include the numbers of students for high schools that are academically ready to begin college, passing state approved employer certification exams, succeeding academically in challenging coursework like AP and IB programs, passing reading, math, state exams at readiness levels for high school graduations, folks that are meeting college readiness requirements, eligibility requirements for merit scholarships, earning post-secondary education, the dual enrollment AP courses, IB courses are all good for kids and access to those at the high school level ought to be part of the rules of how high schools are graded by a state. It changes behaviors. If you want to change the way a game is played, you change the way you keep score. If you want to change principals and schools and K-12 school leaders' behavior, you change the way you keep score. That's how you change behavior. And what you have to keep score on is not just the performance measures, but the process measures. And the process measures, like these percentages of kids that are given access, close gaps. Uh, achievement gaps exist. 
There are achievement gaps between states, between districts, between schools, between students. But achievement gaps never have existed without opportunity gaps, access gaps, expectation gaps that are there that we can close first. And those are by process goals that we close those. What should districts do? Districts have to develop and work with institutions of higher learning like this one to develop their own school leaders. There are virtually no instances of schools turning around without the absence of a talented leader. Leadership has to be the catalyst there. Principals have to be learning-centered leaders. I'm now married to a brand new rookie middle school principal. She just became, she just opened school up. She's had her students for about eight days. And she is mired in all the administrivia that is being a school principal. And so I asked her about teaching and learning the other day. She said, man, I have to find time to get around to be in, in the classrooms more. And I said, you'll never get around to it. Nobody will, nobody will ever come to your desk and hand you something labeled around to it. <laughs> Doesn't happen. The only way that you're ever going to get in that side of that classroom is to say between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock, I will be in the classrooms. Here's my walkie-talkie. You can call me on my cell phone if the building's on fire. If you disturb me and the building's not on fire, we got a problem. <laughs> That's, you got you to take instructional leadership very seriously. It's not just managing schools. It's about improving teaching and learning. And oftentimes that means we've got to hire a different principal than we've hired in the past. It's not just around managing the school. It's not just around holding in the middle of the road. It's not just around keeping the ground that we've got. It's around improving teaching and learning. And if you've got principals that cannot directly themselves impact teaching and learning in a school building, then we have to address that. Um, school the school and the community has to be focused on the school's mission. They got to serve as an instructional leader. They got to review instructional plan. They got to give feedback that results. Use of early warning indicators for interventions. You know that the early warning indicators for freshman students that are going to drop out are extremely clear, and they can be measured very easily. Do you know that if I, and this would make sense to you, if you have a freshman student in a high school that misses more than two days a month. The graduation for that subset of students is 32%. If you have a, take that subset of freshmen and further get that subset down and say that they have one discipline referral during the year, only one. So they miss two days a month and have one discipline referral. You're down to a 16% graduation for that subset of kids. If you take a kid that is missing two days a month of school, that has one discipline referral and is failing one course, you know what his graduation rate is? 8%. All you got to monitor is grades, attendance, and discipline. It'll tell you who your kids are. It'll tell you who your kids are. You got to use indicators. You got to use indicators there. You got to hold middle grades accountable. You got to redesign grade nine. For every 100 eighth graders in SREB states in 2006, there were 15 more ninth graders in 2007. There is a ninth grade bulge. What should schools and universities do? Well, one of the things is getting the mission right and holding yourselves accountable for meeting that mission. I love your mission, by the way. I'm going to give you some mission statements and you guess the company. To solve unsolved problems innovatively. Anybody know who that is? That's 3M. That was a hard one, all right? Now I got you away <laughs> to give unlimited opportunity to women. Guess. Who do you think? Well, that's Mary Kay. <laughs> a passion to create plus a mission to enrich lives. Who's that? A passion to create plus a mission to enrich lives. That's Hallmark. <laughs> to give ordinary, this one's close to home. Y'all don't get this one now, we, we're going to put you in the video. <laughs> to give ordinary folk the chance to buy the same things as rich people. Wow. <laughs> ah, here we go. <laughs> to make people happy. That's Disney. 
Four different kinds of schools, four different kinds of colleges, four different kinds of universities, four different kinds of mission statements. The Charles Darwin School. We believe that all kids can learn based on their ability. The Pontius Pilate School. We believe that all kids can learn if they take advantage of the opportunity that we give them. Chicago Fan Club School. We believe all kids can learn something. <laughs> and we will help our students experience academic growth in a warm and nurturing environment. The Henry Higgins School. We believe that all kids can learn. And we believe that we have the skill and the will and we will work to help all those students achieve the high standards of learning. Now one of the things we do when we do workshops with school leaders is we ask them where their school is. And nine out of 10 high school leaders say their school is a Pontius Pilate school. Half of middle school leaders say their school is a Pontius Pilate school. The other half says it's a Chicago fan club school. <coughs> that home, that warm, nurturing environment. If you walk inside the average high school or the average middle school that serves your community and walk in the lobby, you'll see it over there on the left-hand side, their mission statement. It's always on the left-hand side of the lobby. I don't know why. The trophy case is on the right hand. The mission statement's on the left. You just look for it. And the mission statement, somebody told them that the mission statement had to be one sentence. And so they've got 317 words crammed into one sentence. <laughs> Take a deep breath and read it to the beginning. And what it is, is they don't really have a mission statement. What they really got is a belief value statement, mission statement, theory of change, theory of action, um, a foundational beliefs type statement, along with a purpose for education in general, all crammed into their mission statement. It begins with something like, we believe that all kids, all of us working together in this community, that we can create the right kind of conditions for everything to happen. And it ends with something like creating great Americans. <laughs> the challenge is, is creating great Americans is hard to hold yourself accountable for. That's my point. The missions of a middle school is not to create great Americans. The mission of a middle school is to create great ninth graders. Hold yourself accountable for. The mission of a high school is not to create a nurturing, warm, growing environment where kids can succeed. The mission of a high school is to prepare kids to come to you, ready to learn. That's what it's for. So you got to hold yourself accountable for missions. you got to look and shift yourself a little bit toward the Henry Higgins School. See, that Pontius Pilate School, the reason why so many high schools, 9 out of 10, align themselves with that Pontius Pilate School, is the gatekeeper mentality. If you read that Pontius Pilate statement over and over again, you'll recognize that high school somewhere, either from your own background or your own community, or you'll know about one that was like that. Or maybe even possibly have taught in one that was like that. Or may have kids that go to school in one that's like that. I pulled your mission off your website. If this is not your official blessed mission, it's just because it's the one I pulled off the website. The second oldest land grant institution in the state of Arkansas, the mission of this No Excuses, I got that part right. I heard that. The No Excuses University remains the same to provide a high quality, affordable education with a personal touch. That is a great mission statement. That is great. Then there's appeal to become a golden lion. I want to be, next time I'm here, I want you to just introduce me as part of the family. <laughs> instead, of, instead of the guest speaker. I want to be a part of the golden family, golden lion story as well, the University of Arkansas at Pine Buff, where you'll be proud to be. And that's an appeal to students, and I hope every one of them are proud to be here. I hope every one of you are proud to be here. My challenge to you is make yourselves accountable to this mission by making that mission functional by determining metrics around whether you're meeting that mission or not. The same as the mission of a middle school, it feels good to create that warm and nurturing environment. It feels good to say we're creating great Americans. It is letting yourself off the hook for accountability if you're in the middle school. That middle school mission, whether it feels good or not, is to create a great ninth grader. You have a mission. Your mission is clear. Determine your metrics around that mission. Determine whether you're meeting your mark by determining what values those metrics have. Now there is something clear about this. As you do, metrics is nothing more than a measure, okay? A metric is a measure. When you determine your measures of whether or not you're meeting your mission or not, 
you have to identify targets of where we would be first if we're meeting that mission. Then you have to determine where you currently are. If you start with where you currently are, you won't dream big enough or bold enough. What would your graduation rate be? What would your student achievement be? What would your number of students graduating with, with credentials, what would your number of fields of certification be? What would you, if you were meeting your mission, then where are we right now? And how do we close the gap on that within three years? That helps you set bold targets. See, I'd like you to graduate at least 85% of every freshman that you got in here right now. I'd like you to graduate at least, your country needs you, your state needs you, this community needs you to graduate 85% of the freshmen that you take in are better. 85% are better. So find, find out where you are right now. And then set bold targets to close that within three years out of day. There's two different areas that you want to look at when you set these bold targets. One is around achievement. Students prepare for high wage, high demand careers and further academic study when they leave you. That is a mission. You'll determine your metrics around those particular pieces. The other is completion. How many of you students that walk into your door leave you four years later with a degree? Or any other way that you want to determine completion that is a success? And set annual goals around closing those gaps. And hold yourself accountable for meeting the mission. I love the accountability statement that's there. That early warning system, it seems to me, for freshman student risk factors is very good for you as well. You have the freshman problem just as much as any high school has a freshman problem. It's a freshman issue. It's getting them to come back to the sophomore year. What works for high schools, I submit to you, is going to be very much the same behavior that works for you. You need some type of system that tracks kids that are missing more than two classes. You need some type of system that tracks overall, not just in one individual teacher's classroom, kids that are making consistently grades below 70. And then you need to identify and put your arms around certain groups of students. One group of students is the freshman class in general. The second group of students is your freshman class that are in remediation. And your third group of students, freshman class, whether they're in remediation or not, that are minority males. You can't lose them one. I challenge you to know every one of those students' names, to know every one of those students' backgrounds, to know every, give it that personal, there's something in your mission statement about a personal touch, isn't there? Give that personal touch to that group of kids and return every single one of them as a sophomore. Return every minority male that enters your campus this year as a freshman. It will take every one of you effort. It will be hard to do. You will miss one or two, but I guarantee you, you can significantly increase the number that you are to return your sophomore year. But it's going to take a concerted effort. That's where the challenge is. Your country needs you to do that. Teach, how do you do that? What do you do with these freshman students that come to you? Well, you've got to teach them the standards with the proper support. If you're behind in a race, and we'll talk about that more in just a second, you can't slow down and catch up. You've got to have teachers with a history of success to teach at-risk students. That means freshman teachers are the most important teachers that you've got in this campus, believe it or not. They're the ones that will make a difference with your graduation. Frequent formative assessments. Frequent formative assessments. Formative means formative. Formative means formative. I'm going to tell you one more time. Formative means formative. Can formative change? Yes. Summative is the only thing that can't change. Why is it okay to have kids retake courses, but it's not okay to have kids retake a test? You've got to think about why we do things. What's the purpose of a grade? It's to measure a kid's progress against a standard. If that kid can show more progress later against that standard than he can show initially with your help, should his final grade reflect his final standing against that standard, or should it reflect that 32 that he made on the first math test? You know? Okay? Formative assessments. Required redo systems of extra help. There's a difference in extra help that's available. There's, a There's two areas in this country where we mess kids up that are underadvantaged, underserved, however you want to put it. 
minority males is one of those groups. There's two areas where we mess kids up. I tell you what, first one in your family going to college is just as bad. I was in that same boat. First one, I didn't fill out my FAFSA my senior year because I was the first one in my family to go to college. I didn't get college financial aid my freshman year. I did start my sophomore year. I didn't know to fill out the FAFSA, but nobody made me. So when the counselor came on the intercom and said, fast forms are in the counselor's office, stop by and get them if you want to. <laughs> I didn't know what FASPA stood for, and I know I didn't want to. <laughs> Invitational guidance and advisement does not serve the kids that need it most. Invitational extra help does not serve the kids that need it the most. You need systems of guidance and advisement. And systems of extra help. And by system, I mean there's a protocol-driven way that you get yourself into it, and there's a protocol-driven way that you exit yourself from it. For extra help, that's grades. For guidance and advisement, it ought to be your sta academic standing, and it ought to be your freshman standing. When you're a freshman, there ought to be required guidance and advisement activities that you go through on this campus. And I can tell you, it takes a lot of persistence. Advisors, how many of y'all are advisors? Everybody should be, right? Advisors, I want to tell you what is historical. Now, I'm an adjunct college professor, okay? So I teach, the only thing they let me teach is principles, okay? They don't let me mess up the young kids. The only thing they let me teach is folks how to be a principal. And I teach the test and measurement too in the, in the statistics. They figure those folks are far enough along that I won't mess them up too far. But with the guidance and advisement piece, I'm just like you. I counsel myself against saying this, but it's just on me to say it. So if I hurt your feelings, you know what? I come from Baptist tradition, and sometimes you've got to make folks, you know, smell a little the brimstone, fill a little the fire in order to get more folks to heaven. <laughs> so, you know, here it comes. I'm going to say it in spite of my better judgment. Advisors, you don't need to be an enemy. I want to tell you what. Now, I've been in college. I got as many, between me and my wife, we got as many degrees as a thermometer. Okay? <laughs> And I got two boys that are coming up. I've got other members of my family. And it is almost comical how much students eventually say, I gotta read the handbook and I gotta know everything to make sure I keep my advisor straight. <laughs> <laughs> well, that works well for my wife. It turned out working okay for me. It works well for someone. It will not work for these kids I'm talking about reaching. These kids I'm talking about reaching can't keep you straight. You've got to keep them straight, okay? So that role that sometimes is a tack-on role might be the very most important role. And it might be that freshman students ought to be required to pick up their grades from their advisor, and the advisor ought to track all the grades in all their classes. And the advisors ought to decide what types of mandatory extra help that they're going to have after the first term progress reports. It might be that there's some things that you've got to do to put nets under kids. I know a lot about academic freedom, and I know a lot about teaching kids responsibility. But you're not going to teach kids responsibility after they drop out and leave you. You've got to keep them with you long enough to teach them responsibility. Okay? Most fundamental mistakes schools make with remediation, and they do this in the middle grades, in the high school, and at the college level. The most fundamental mistake that schools make with remediation is they slow it down. You cannot slow it down and have no sense of urgency to catch anybody up. If I'm behind in a race, I got to hurry up and catch up. If I'm behind in a race, it doesn't do me any good for somebody to put their arm around me and say, oh, son, you are way behind in this race. Come drink some of this Gatorade. <laughs> Come sit with me for a little while. You want these pieces of fried chicken? I know you love them because I love them. That's what I, that's what I want to eat all the time. That's the reason why I can't run the race. That's the reason why I can't keep up with the rest of them. It doesn't do me any good for people to give me the things that I think I want and the things that make them good. See, it makes it good to feel that person that's putting that Gatorade on. It makes, it makes me feel good. It makes them feel good. You know what? It's not good for me. Not in the long run. Somebody needs to hurry up and catch me up to that race if I'm going to run faster in that race. 
you, it's tough love. You can't all baby. The more people are dropped out through all baby than anything else. Don't all baby anything. Don't differentiate your expectations. Differentiate the level of help that you give them. So you have to expose kids to the standards that are expected of them with proper support. So you don't take a ninth grader and teach them at the sixth grade level. You take a ninth grader and you expose them to ninth grade standards and you provide for them the scaffolded system of extra help, whether it's at the, starting at the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade level, but you have to still expose them to the ninth grade. Because if a kid is not, if a kid is 16, 17 years old in the ninth grade and you slow it down for them, you'll never catch them up. Same thing with freshmen that come to you. You've got to expose them to freshman level courses, but you've got to provide them the right scaffolding approach there. Exposure, but with systems of extra help that's appropriate. What should teachers do? What should you do in this audience? You've got to engage kids intellectually. You've got to engage kids emotionally. You've got to engage kids socially, and you've got to engage kids behaviorally. If you're going to do those four things, that means when you're deciding and you're lesson planning, and you're planning out what it is that you're going to cover that day, it's not just a matter of determining, and it's not the most important thing to determine what it is you're going to cover. How you're going to teach it is, most, is just as important. That kid that no longer decided he wanted to be an engineer is October of his freshman year, it wasn't what the content was being covered. It was how it was being covered. He was used to engineering taught in a project problem-based environment like Project Lead the Way where kids go in and they start with a project and they scaffold in the set of skills it takes because they're already engaged intellectually, emotionally, socially with groups of kids and behavior. And then they'll work harder and they'll put forth the effort. See, the difference in a kid that's engaged intellectually, emotionally, socially, and behaviorally is you'll get more effort out of them. No matter how much effort you put forth, your extra effort is no good unless you get extra effort out of the student. It is only through effort that they learn. So your effort has to be around getting them to make effort. And the only way that you get kids to make more effort is to engage them. It's a lot of E words. And you've got to have the efficacy that you think that you can engage kids that you've never reached before. So you've got to try things you've never reached before. You've got to, you've got to do things that you've never done before. The most important thing a teacher can do to create this kind of environment is a relentless academic press for all kids. You gotta ask yourself, what's the purpose of a grade? What's the purpose of an assessment? Why am I doing that? If my focus is on mastery, then that means that if a kid hasn't mastered the concept, then I have a responsibility as well as that kid's got a responsibility. It's my responsibility to reach back out to that kid, try to reteach that kid, provide them extra help and extra time that's required, Differentiate my instruction, give them hope, measure their response to my intervention. There's a whole bunch of sexy words out there in education right now. This is a whole list of those sexy words. If you're going to write a grant, these are the words you've got to put in. Formative assessment, measuring mastery, reteaching, extra help, extra time, differentiated instruction and response to intervention, RTI is the new one. Y'all watch how often you see that. All of those are just fancy new ways of saying what made a difference to you in your life as a teacher. Teachers that said, you're going to do this over and over again until you get it right. It's not my job to babysit you. It's not my job. I'm not getting paid by the state of Arkansas to babysit you. I'm getting paid by the state of Arkansas to teach you. And that means in my classroom, if you don't learn, I've taken the state of Arkansas's money and not done my job. And son, you are not going to make a thief out of me. You are going to learn in my class. That's the biggest thing that you can do to make a difference. All of those things require you to engage kids around their hopes, dreams, and aspirations. Never make the mistake of forgetting that what we're all here for is kids. Find out your kids' hopes, dreams, aspirations, and engage them around those hopes, dreams, and aspirations and you'll get more effort out of those kids. I challenge you to have a great school year. I challenge you to take your mission statement and dissect it, set yourself metrics and measures and hold each other accountable for reaching that. And I have every hope and belief that you will do so because of the great leadership you have at this university. Thank you for letting me be with you.
Dr. Broome, that was excellent. And I'm going to make you go to the line today because we come forward. I just need to do it here. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Carroll, for the introduction. Dr. Broome, thank you for returning again to Arkansas to share with us very explicit information on how we can make a difference in terms of reaching our students. We knew he would do that, and that is really why the planning committee said right from the start, we have to bring Dr. Broom back to talk to this audience. Remember now, you have heard Dr. Davis give you the chance, the campus action plan. You have now heard from a regional perspective on where we should be in terms of education. Right after a short break, you are going to hear what the state of Arkansas is expecting us to do. And our panel is in place. I will not introduce them. I will ask them to stand, though, so you can just see the next panel that you will hear. So would you please stand and be received by this audience. And Dr. Johnson, thank, thank you so very much. I'm beginning to feel that I don't have enough paper up here to take notes on. Next year, we're going to put more pages in the back for you to take notes on because this is good information. And remember that on tomorrow, when you go into your divisional meetings, this is where we want you to start from. When you go into your departmental meetings, the same thing. And finally, when you end up at your official post, as a counselor, a teacher, financial aid officer, physical plant worker, wherever you are as a stakeholder in this university, we want you to take these ideas and this planning strategy with you. And I bet you we will increase that retention and graduation rate that we have talked about as quantitative measures of outcome. 